There we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Madeline Kovaleski. I'm with the Mizzou Mindful Lab. Um, this uh, project was sponsored by Night Vision, and we're going to be talking about um, an explosive hazard pre-screener based on simulated data with perfect annotation and imprecisely labeled real data. <clears throat> So then, uh, again, this is an explosive hazard detection algorithm. Uh, for the data collection, some specific parameters here, we used a drone to collect that data. So it's uh, abbreviated as an unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, at a low altitude. Um, and then that real data that we collected is, in fact, class imbalanced. Uh, it's a little bit imprecise in the frequency of targets and the types of targets. But then we were experimenting with adding simulated data to that to overcome some of those pitfalls of relying on just real training data. Um, and we classify this as data augmentation. <clears throat> so then um, we wanted to use a semantic segmentation algorithm uh, for EHD prescreening. Um, and then we use perpixel labeling on that simulated data versus axis aligned bounding boxes on the real data. And then, uh, so in order to identify how we were going to really collate those data sets and make sure that that simulated data would fill in the gaps there, we conducted a series of experiments that combined real data versus simulated data. So then we had a few different data types that we were putting into this algorithm. Um, this included, again, that simulated and the real data. And then we have a spectrum of different types of simulated and real data. So on the simulated data side of things, we go from the spectrum of abstraction of reality. So we start at the cartoony end of things with very abstracted features to uh, game engine quality, abbreviated as GEQ data, which is a little bit more detailed, all the way up to incredibly detailed um, UE5 data. This is Unreal Engine 5. Um, it's typically used for video game rendering. We have another really great talk on that coming up, so be sure to check that out if you're interested. And then um, AMA, I forget the actual um, abbreviation for AMA, but it's uh, dropping a scan target into a real background. So that's um, about as close as you can get to real data without it actually being fully real. And then we have our real data with our boxes drawn around the target. Um, and that's all the way at the real end of our reality spectrum. <clears throat> so then, for instance, on that simulated data, we do have per pixel labels for the ground truth. Uh, you can see here there's two round targets, and then uh, they're uh, labeled in the ground truth, just like fully filled in. Versus our axis aligned bounding boxes on the other end, there's a box drawn around it. And then in order to ground truth those images, we had another uh, program that would run through that real data set and just fill in the boxes. So it is imprecise there because it catches a little bit of the background. But we found some interesting results uh, using that. And then for the experiments in the big picture here, we would train a model with a combination of data here. So like um, there would be, say, UE5 data and real data put into a data set and then through the model or just game engine quality through the model or cartoon data through the model and the different combinations of that. And then we scored those with a rock curve and also just looking at it and seeing how good it looked. Um, and then again, we have our reality spectrum here. So you can kind of see uh, more clearly what that abstraction kind of looks like. There's um, very abstracted features on the art and cartoon end, and then it gets very high frequency, uh, detailed imagery on the right end of the reality spectrum. So then here would be some parameters for a simulated data set. Again, check out Jeffrey Curley's talk later if you want a more detailed explanation of that. But we had uh, around 9,000 images in uh, our in our model, and then our environments were all arid. Uh, this included a variety of different background objects, like foliage, rocks, stumps, all kinds of good stuff, and then uh, the background texture, which was usually sandy or rocky. Uh, and then we also had a, a bunch of confuser objects that were similar to what you might see in the actual real data. Uh, this included vehicles, buildings, fences, cones, things that could potentially look like targets but are not. Um, and then the drone altitude was between 20 and 40 meters with a random pitch perturbation just to kind of make it look like it was actually flying. So then some important information here about that simulated data. Uh, 
So in UE5, you can create simulated scenes, just completely render them fully in the machine, or you can scan objects in. Um, and then uh, all of that information is freely accessible. So there is a degree of reproducibility to all of that data. Um, and then we can access information about every scene that we make, including depth, IDs, shadows, occlusion, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and that also adds to like, we have a huge amount of information at our disposal for creating simulated data, something that we definitely don't have for real data. So then uh, let's look at some of our first simulated data that we made. Um, you can see here that there's a lot of variation in the target color, the target positioning, the altitude. It's kind of difficult to see and it doesn't look a whole lot like the real targets aside from the shape. But we noticed when we were feeding these into the algorithm that it was actually showing decent, like it was, it was pretty promising in the results. You could see the objects, you could see possible things that it was picking up, um, which really cued us in, hey, there's something here, we can look at this. Um, so then some new cartoon and GEQ data. Um, this is also like just another example of those features that we were looking at. Um, there's more exaggerated color. The features look more like the actual targets, but just abstracted. It's not a pop art render of the original image. So um, we can emphasize more directly here the lighting, the contrast. Uh, it's a little bit more procedural. And uh, it's um, definitely a more detailed approach to that simulated data and um, a little bit more quantitative. So then the actual pre-screener itself. Um, <clears throat> we used a unit, which uh, the important part here is that when it gives us output, it gives that output as per pixel too, so we can see where the objects are and what it's picking up. So on the left half of the unit, it would take in an image, downsample it, and look for the features. So that feature extraction um, all happens on the left side, as you can see circled. Um, and then on the right side, that's where it's blowing the image back up and telling us where it is. So we have the what, and then we have the where on the unit. Um, and then that's just a, we didn't modify the unit a whole lot. It used um, a dice loss function and some other things, but all of that is again, freely accessible. We have the code base, there is reproducibility there. So then some preliminary results there. Um, we, we used um, a game engine quality and two model on real data. So you can see with um, this image here, these preliminary results, we did have some false alarms and then our true positive. Um, keep in mind that a pre-screener is supposed to be very sensitive. It'll pick up a lot of targets um, and hopefully all of the true positives with it so that um, you can then go back over that imagery and look for what you're actually trying to find. Um, and you can see also with the false alarms, another thing that's promising here is that they're fairly plausible in shape. We had a target that was um, it had a lot of legs coming out of the bottom of it, and you can kind of see that shape reflected in the false alarm at the top left corner. Um, and then a sort of a ambiguously round object, again, a fairly plausible mistake for the machine at the bottom, and then our true positive there on the right. Something that says, hey, this could really be working. Um, and then we see this trend reflected in a lot of our other preliminary results here. Even with the old simulated data, it was still getting targets pretty consistently. And then that was even more consistent with our new sim data. So then there's some examples of some real data. Um, there's some obvious targets in a few. I think that the bottom right image all the way on the right is kind of the easiest to see. There's one sort of in the left of the image. Um, that's like what the target looks like. Again, kind of an ambiguous round object. So you can again, really start to understand uh, why the machine might look for something like that in its uh, false alarms as well. Um, but also the lighting varies and then the altitude varies. There's some things that make the real data like you really do kind of need that uh, supplementary data set augmentation. So then our actual results here, uh, we scored these on rock curves and there's some valuable information that you can pull out of each of these graphs here. Uh, we notice really quickly that the simulated and the real data quickly pulls ahead uh, on most of these, except for object one in which it misses, it completely misses an object all the way in the bottom corner of um, one of the images. 
Um, so we didn't know whether or not that was going to be significant as it's occluded. It's kind of way off in the corner. Uh, maybe, maybe is not a relevant um, thing to consider, but we, it, obviously it is important in this aspect. And then we have object two, which has a very unique shape. And you can see that the uh, real data and the sim and real data are very close here. Um, and then for our other two objects, these are both um, kind of these like ambiguously round things, but then one of them has a very unique shape and contrast, which makes it easy to pick out. Um, overall, in objects one through four, we can see that the sim and real data really does start to pull ahead of the other two there on the confidence side of things. So uh, very preliminary, but again, does suggest that there's something here that we really need to be looking at. And then all of our targets. So this is the really, really interesting part of things. We tested these here on um, all of our objects, not just the ones that we've disclosed for the paper. Some of those objects are very visually different from the ones that we were looking at in that last set of graphs. Uh, but some of them are similar in shape and features. All of them are in that arid background. Um, and then there's that usual variation in the real data where they might be occluded, hard to see for the machine. Um, and then all of them have that background in the ground truth too. So it's, um, again, very ambiguous here, but we can see that um, the sim and real data, again, pulls way out front. And then the question is, why does it do that? The just sim data um, drops off here too. Um, so some theorization on why that might be the case. Um, that sim data doesn't have any of the non-disclosed objects in it. It's not shown them at all, whereas the real data does have them in there, but they're imprecisely labeled. Um, so the sim and real data would have access to the ground truth that's imprecisely labeled for the objects that were not disclosed, but again, they're imprecisely labeled. Um, so then why does it pull way out front when it's not given any new information about those objects? Um, this could be because it has a little bit more... Um, context for the background, for the angle that it's looking at the object. It might be able to make some extrapolations for the ones that are similar in shape. We don't know, but it did well. So there's definitely something to look at there. So then uh, the kind of wrapping up that idea there, we used a UNET pre-screener on simulated and real data combined, and we had fairly good results with it. Um, but, however, this is a very small and niche domain. Um, this is where that reproducibility really comes in handy because there's definitely ways that you could adapt this same experiment for a different set of parameters. So then our observations with that was that the simulated data definitely had some advantages with the amount of control that we have over it. Um, you get novel poses, scales, shadows, you know everything about the image that you're um, feeding into the machine and you can identify and be very, very precise with your parameters. But then the real world data did a little bit better when actually imaging things. Um, so then why are we getting a lot more out of the real and sim data? We don't know. We can again theorize that that's happening during feature extraction. We know it's in the left half of the unit, but we don't know why or where it is. So then that just leaves us with a lot of further questions. We still haven't looked into transfer learn with a simulated model. Um, and then there's a lot of questions about our visual abstraction. Where are our features coming from and why are they coming from there? Um, and then can we use that simulated data to ensure learning the right features? So there's plenty of room for refining simulated data collection. Uh, check out Jeffrey Curley's talk again. There's a lot more information about that simulated data. Um, and then thank you very much.